Okay, so we're going to talk about cardiac radiology, and uh, you should have access to the slides. If you don't, let me know, and I can show you how to get access. Um, okay. These are the goals. Uh, we're going to go through the quiz. This is you know, similar to other lectures based on the USMLE content list. Uh, we're going to go through normal structures, infection, cancers, uh, ischemic heart disease, cardiomyopathies, uh, valvular diseases, and congenital disorders. What this lecture does not include is vascular. This is just cardiac. Uh, it doesn't have vascular stuff because it's just too much to cover in one lecture, and there's already we already have almost 90 slides. Um, so we're going to stick to cardiac, okay? So we're starting off with a quiz. Um, you guys know the routine. Uh, please shout out your answers or text it in, and um, then we'll have a fun lecture. Okay. What is this arrow pointing to? Oops. Good, LED. What, oh my, oh yes. Um, so what is the structure? Uh, no, what's the structure? Good, this is the interventricular septum. Good, and what is the structure here? The right ventricle, right atrium. And then what are these um, vessels that are going into this chamber here? There's four of them on both sides. Pulmonary veins, good. And they have oxygenated or non-oxygenated blood? Oxygenated, right? And so they drain the pulmonary, the, the lungs after it's been um, oxygenated. And what is, this, um, what is this valve here that connects the, what is this good? Mitral valve, right? And what is this muscle here? that has a chordae tendine that is attached to the mitral valve and that helps it close and open. Good, these are the papillary muscles. And you see this is the what ventricle? Left ventricle, right? So, and you know that why? The muscles of the left ventricles are what compared to the right ventricle? Thick, yes, they're very thick because that's the pump. Uh, in the right side, right, the the wall is very thin because it's a low pressure system um, in contrast to the left side, which pumps against um, the high pressure system through this valve. What is this valve called? Aortic valve. And how many um, leaflets are in the Good, three leaflets, right? You can sort of see it. You, you need MR to see it better. But um, here's a normal valve. Uh, sometimes you can get heavy calcifications that can then lead to what condition? And sometimes, yes, aortic stenosis. Sometimes patients can have um, bivalve, so two valves instead of three, like a congenital anomaly, and that can also increase their risk of aortic stenosis. Um, what else is on this? Okay, so, and then this, this structure is what? In the back? Most posterior structure? Is this? Uh, it's the aorta, right, because it's enhancing. Good. And then what is this vessel here? So there's um, this coronary artery vessel. What's this vessel here, which gives off the PDA in 85% of, good, RCA. And we don't see the LAD, but it's usually in the groove. Maybe this one, it's hard, to see. it's not arterial phase, so we don't see it very well. Um, okay, fine. Um, this type of endocarditis usually involves strep viridens, uh, which is considered a little bit lower virulence. Uh, you can have smaller forms of vegetation compared to um, a different kind of endocarditis, and it's usually due to dental procedures and it's gradual onset, subacute, right? And this is in contrast to what other type of endocarditis? Acute, right, which is usually staph aureus, patients are sick, these are the people with IV drug use, um, most common cardiac malignancy is metastases. True or false? Most com common cardiac tumors 
are Mets, true or false? 50-50. Is everyone in agreement? We're 50-50 so far. Milo says false, false. Okay, most people think it's false. Okay. What is the most common cause of myocarditis? So lots of causes of myocarditis, and the most common is what? Infection, go down the vitamin list. Vascular, infection, idiopathic, trauma. Okay, we think it's infection. Um, and what kind of infection? Bacterial, viral, fungal. Okay, most people think it's bacterial. Okay, the arrows, the arrow, there's one arrow that demonstrates what? Okay, so earlier we saw the mitral valve. This is a different view of longitudinal. It's a flail mitral, good, okay. So we saw the mitral valve and um, that was being attached by the, what muscle again? Papillary muscles, okay. And, um, and it's attached to the, attached to the valve by corda, the cords right here, um, corda tendine. Um, so here the valves are not kissing each other. They're not, they're not opposed, right? This one is overlapping that. So it's sort of like, Fla like just flailing um, and this condition is called what what do you what do we call this condition when you have a flail mitral valve mitral valve prolapse good right um, they and that so then you have improper closure of the mitral valve so you get regurgitation and you get regurgitation that leads to this condition here right you get marked enlargement um, and what, what is a cause of mitral valve prolapse? There's lots of different causes, but give me some causes of mitral valve prolapse. Am I good? And why does am I right? So am I causes papillary muscle rupture, which good leads to then mitral valve prolapse. Good. Um, okay. What is the problem here? So watch, watch this video. This is a cardiac syne. Um, and so what do we say this valve was again? What is this valve? Mitral valve, good. And so now you have right, systole and diastole. So you, systole is when it contracts. Let's try it again. So here you have contraction. And so on contraction, the valve is supposed to be closed and it's supposed to go out the aorta, right? But instead of um, closing, it has this regurgitant jet. So this is called, good, mitral regurg, good. Um, when do we see left ventricular free wall rupture after MI? Okay, so Kathy thinks C, five to seven, B, B, C, okay, anyone can, any, okay, so Milo thinks a C. Anyone else? Okay, C or D, okay, so most people think it's probably a delayed complication. Okay, we'll talk about that. Most common cardiomyopathy is what? Uh, dilated, hypertrophic, restrictive, left ventricular non-compaction, right ventricular dysplasia. Okay, so we're be between B and C. So B is hypertrophic, C is restrictive, and some for A, which is dilated. Okay, great. This I love this because this means we got something to learn. Oh, shoot. Um, that was supposed to come later. Um, the exam here shows what? So this is another cardiac syne, uh, which is better um, typically to look at flow dynamics and structural problems. Uh, then let's say cardiac echo. Although, you know, you want to do cardiac echo first. It's complementary. Okay. So anyway, so what valve, what we said, this is a mitral valve, right? And then here is what, what valve here, where the arrow is circling around. Okay, aortic valve stenosis. And why, why, why do you think this is aortic valve stenosis? So this is contraction. So on contraction, it's supposed, everything is supposed to go through and so it's going through. But then, um, small jet. Yeah, there's a little jet here, this little right there, that white, white signal. 
And then um, I, I can't really see it well, but the aorta is a little big from because a jet is the call, they call it postenotic aortic ectasia. It's stiff. Good. And what causes a stiff aortic valve? What are some causes? A lot of causes, but calcifications good. So heavy calcifications. What else causes um, aortic valve stenosis? Normal aging. Yeah, which leads to calcifications. Okay, what else? Athero. Athero usually refers to vessels, like atherosclerotic calcification of the vessels, but calcifications, nevertheless. Okay, and the bicuspid um, conditions. Bi yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, one second. Um, how do I pause this? True or false? Right to left shunts causes late stenosis, cyanosis. Oh, I misspelled causes. True or false? Right to left shunt causes late cyanosis. Okay, true. True, okay. Early cyanosis. Okay, Peter's saying no, maybe it's early cyanosis, not late cyanosis. Okay. <laughs> thoughts? <laughs> so, what, what's, so we're a split between early and late? Is that what it is? Where is the rest of the 27 people that are signed on? What do you all think? True, true. All right, so we, we're going to learn some of this too. Which congenital syndrome can lead to bicuspid aortic valve Eor and coarctation of the aorta? Prenatal lithium exposure, Turner syndrome, Williams syndrome, or 22Q11 syndrome? This is your um, first aid high yield stuff. A, okay. Any other guesses? B, Turner. Anyone for C or D? Okay, most people are guessing B. Okay. Okay, so B is, seems like the winning answer choice. Great. Okay, all right, let's get to the anatomy. Um, this is, I believe, an hour and a half lecture. Is that correct? Okay, all right. So um, coronary arteries, uh, they're important to know. We have um, the right coronary, left coronary. Remember, aorta is aortic valve is three leaflets. So you have the right and left coronary cusp, and then there's a non-coronary cusp. That's the third leaflet. And the left coronary artery gives off the LAD, which supplies what part of the heart? Left ventricle. Good. And this vessel is also the most commonly involved vessel with MI. So that's a problem, right? We said the left ventricle is the pump. So if you take this out, you basically undermine the pump function. This is what leads to papillary rupture and all these other problems is the occlusion of LED. But you also have circumflex, you have the right coronary, and the PDA supplies the posterior part of the heart. Um, that can vary in its origin, but most commonly coming from the right coronary in 85%. This is from first aid. Uh, so we have, um, I guess, a cartoon version of what we just saw, um, LAD. Um, so this supplies the intraventricular septum and the papillary muscle. It's also coming, the papillary muscle is also supplied by the left circumflex. And if you have disruption, then that can lead to rupture, which then leads to regurgitation, acute mitral valve regurgitation. Uh, this is... Um, and then these are the other coronary arteries. So per first aid, this is what you need to know. Um, the right coronary supplies the, the nodes. So I guess if you take it out, then you can get arrhythmias. Uh, and that's, that's a problem because then you can lead to bradycardia and heart block. Uh, we talked about the PDA already. Um, Co-dominant, okay. Coronary artery most commonly occur in the LAD. Remember, this is what leads to some of the morbidity that we see with post in my cases. Um, the most posterior part of the heart is the left atrium. This receives vest supply, oxygenated blood from the uh, lungs. And so the pulmonary veins drain into the left atrium, but sometimes they can have an anomalous drainage 
right? So instead of the oxygenated blood going into the left atrium, like this is just a closed off chamber and the veins can then drain into other parts. So it can go into the coronary sinus, it can go back into the, it can go into the sort of the right um, heart side of the heart, like the non-oxygenated part. And so that's called a anomalous pulmonary vein insertion, insertion where you don't have the veins actually draining into the left atrium, but either uh, it goes into the coronary sinus, it goes into the SVC, they, you know, it could be super infradiaphragmatic. So all this is a normal connection, but you can have congenitally abnormal connection that then leads to problems later. Uh, we said this is the um, septum. Oh, and also know uh, if you have, this is the first aid um, high yield thing. If you have enlargement of the left atrium, it can cause compression of the um, esophagus, which is right here. And that can lead to hoarseness um, also because it compresses the left recurrent laryngeal. You know, all of these things you sort of just need to know over the boards in real life, like nobody, we rarely see this. Um, okay, so this is the interventricular septum. Um, disruption of this can lead to what condition? If you have a big hole in the interventricular septum, what do you get? A, a VSD, right? Um, and there's different parts to the interventricular septum. Um, this, um, which we're gonna talk about, this part of the interventricular septum arises from like a different embryonic origin compared to like the rest of it. Um, it's called the infundibulum. And in Tetralogy of Fallot, this, this part is not in the right place. So it's anteriorly located. So it's, it goes anterior and it goes superior. And that, what, that is what will lead to Tetralogy of Fallot, is this malposition of the infundibulum. And we'll talk about that later. Uh, sometimes the hardest thing to know is like the lack of normal anatomy. Uh, so knowing your anatomy is very helpful. Um, okay, now those were the chambers. Now these are the valves. Uh, the valve that we're going to talk about a lot is the aortic valve. It's three, three cusp. So you have three leaflets and you have the coronary and then you have the non-coronary leaflet. Uh, you've got the tricuspid valve, which um, is between in the right system, the right heart system. So it's a low pressure system. Remember, it, you know, the normal valves, um, sort of the location is important. So in one condition, it's called Epstein's anomaly. Uh, the valve, instead of being here, it's down here. But And so what that does is it makes the causes malfunction. Um, so the right system, the right atrium is becomes really big and you basically have a dysfunctional ventricular system. And this is important and you see that in children because it can lead to massive, massive heart. Um, that's one of the conditions within the differential diagnosis for massive heart in young people, your children especially, is um, Epstein's anomaly. Uh, pulmonary um, artery. So uh, this is the pulmonary artery and this is the valve. Uh, this is um, problem if you have atresia, which we'll see in Tetralogy of Fallot, uh, then this becomes really small. So you have an outlet obstruction, which then when you have an outlet obstruction, you're pumping against a very narrowed um, pulmonary artery, then you, you're, you start to have compensatory hyper, hypertrophy. Okay, so let's move on to infection. We're just going down the list of the US EMILY content list. Um, and the first item on that list is infection. Uh, so this is, um, what kind of study is this? Echo, good. And what kind of study is this? This is a CT chest, good. Um, and so what we see here is, um, I, we, I don't read echoes, Car cardiologists do echoes. We do CTs and MARS, um, but what we have is a valve and you normal valve is just the leaflets, but here we have extra stuff like junk um, on this valve. And so, you know, patients with endocarditis are gonna be symptomatic typically. Um, so, 
um, this is uh, vegetations. Uh, and if you had to guess what chamber this is, what chamber would you call this to be, right or left ventricle? Why? Why left ventricle? Why? What? It's um, yeah. It's someone said um, Jordan thick walled, right? Thick walled. So it's um, and the interventricular septum is bowing away from it, which is what you want because it's a high pressure system. The left heart, the left ventricle is the high. So the right side is low pressure. So it it the, the bowing should be uh, towards um, the right heart. The right ventricle. Sometimes you can have um, in septal straightening, or in fact, a bowing towards the side, uh, the left side, and that you can see um, in what condition. When do you start to see the reversal of the interventricular septum bowing to the ipsilateral? Pulmonary hypertension. Good. Pulmonary hypertension, right? So when you when the pressure builds up so much in the right heart, it starts to bow and causes the other side. So pulmonary hypertension, and there's a lot of different causes of pulmonary hypertension, right? This is primary and secondary. Primary is iatrogenic, I mean, idiopathic. We don't know what causes it. Uh, secondary causes of PAH um, can't, it, it, you know, think about pre, post, and intracapillary. Um, so it could be pre-pulmonary capillary. So you think about interstitial lung disease, like anything that makes the lung stiff you can think about capillary sources. So if you have uh, the capillaries like vasculitides, things like that, that cause the fact of capillaries to stiffen up and cause it to be a hyper, you know, a very stiff system and post capillary. So people with um, pulmonary emboli, you know, it can obstruct the pulmonary hypertension. You can also have cardiac sources that can lead to pulmonary hypertension. Um, bacterial, okay, let's, let's keep going. With, oh, so what, what this is showing is, um, in the lung, there's a consolidation here, and this is what happens, one complication of endocarditis. Like part of the bacteria can um, embolize and then go into the lungs and then cause septic emboli. Uh, so that's what that is that we see here. Uh, bacterial endocarditis, this is coming from first aid. Uh, you have a lot of like presentations. Uh, these are these little painless red spots. I guess they call them Janeway lesions. Um, you get splinter hemorrhages. These are like just little bacterial emboli that's sort of like going everywhere. Um, and there are two types, acute, which uh, patients present very sick, uh, typically from staph aureus heavy drug users, large vegetations, and then subacute strep veritans, which like to live in our mouth and can come from dental procedures. Um, so patients who have cardiac prosthesis, heart valve replacement, need prophylaxis so that you can... Um... Okay, question. Michelle asks, why do you get splinter hemorrhages? No idea. No idea, sorry. Um, just memorize it for your boards and then you can forget it afterwards. Um, my, I mean, it's like how many people even present with splinter hemorrhages? But anyways, I'm sorry. I don't know why it causes it. I, am, I imagine some kind of vasculopathy from the underlying sepsis. But I don't know the exact um, pathophysiology for it. Question. Um, this type of endocard, oh, oh my gosh. No, oh, this was one of our questions. Yes, so most of you guys answered this correctly. Subacute endocarditis is more indolent uh, compared to uh, acute, which is, uh, is because of a different bacterial organism. Okay, then moving on to um, infection of the myocardium. Uh, so we, uh, here is, what kind of study is this? This one and this one. MRI, good, there's an MRI study. And so what we see, so the MRI, you know, you have different parts of the heart. You have the epicardial heart, sub-epicardial. So you have endo, epi. So epi is like outside, endo is on the inside, just the inner part of the heart versus the outer part of the heart. And um, we see, this is with contrast. So when you give contrast, you can follow the blood flow. So here, what they're showing is, compared to the other parts of the heart, this part of the heart is enhancing. So there's a lot of blood flow going to it. There's hyperemia, 
And we see that with uh, infection. So there's enhancement. So um, things, you know, enhancement just means there's a response to that. It's like a local regional response. And so um, one of the causes, one causes of enhancement is infection, uh, inflammation, like autoimmune, things like that. So this one, when you, so basically it's inflammation of the myocardium, which is what myocarditis is. Uh, and in this case, there's, it's lymphocytic. Um, we, we can only give a differential diagnosis and then you sort of do everything else to exclude and figure out um, what the cause is. Here, um, we have mid-myocardial enhancement. So this is um, the, which chamber is this, the left or the right? Okay, so we have two questions. One is from Kathy. Uh, the question is, for the first picture, I can't orient myself. What structures am I looking at? Okay, so that's a great question. Uh, so this is an oblique view of the heart. Um, so it's optimized to look at the aorta, aortic valve here. Okay, so um, let me see if I can. So let's just remember our slides. We're at slide 23. Um, and I want to show you the valve picture that we saw earlier. Where is the valve? Here. It's kind of like this, Kathy, but a little lower. So we're looking at the aortic valve, centered at the aortic valve. So let's go back to slide 23. So here's the aortic valve. Um, so that's sort of like the view. Um, so based on that, so here is the aortic valve. This is the left ventricle because that pumps it out of the aortic valve. Uh, here's the pulmonary artery above it, right? So this is the chest wall in the front. Here's the, the ribs. And then the spine is sort of like back here somewhere. Um, and here's the liver right there. And this is the IVC. The head is here. So in imaging, the head is always on top. The feet is always on the bottom. And then here's the uh, anterior. And then here's the right heart, the right ventricle. OK? Um, Okay, Peter has a question. How do we know this is lymphocytic? Uh, you know, that's the patient's diagnosis. Um, if this is the first thing you saw, that would only be in the differential diagnosis. You need to do laboratory studies, other uh, tests to make sure it's not something else. Because myocarditis, right? You go down the vitamin list, right? Vascular, it could be, could it be vascular in nature, like ischemic. Um, because remember, MI can lead to um, like perimyocarditis, things like that. It gets, is it infection? So you have to do blood tests to look for infection, um, autoimmune stuff. So um, this is the patient's final diagnosis, but it's only after a workup of, you know, down the differential diagnosis of what can lead to myocarditis. Uh, but the pattern of enhancement can also help. Um, uh, so if it's epicardial, outer versus an inner, and they have different um, diagnoses. Um, but here are some of the causes, right? So we saw an example of what myocarditis looks like on MR with contrast, but here are all the different causes of it. So yeah, the most common cause is viral, uh, Coxsackie, something you should know, uh, but you can also get um, myocarditis from drugs. Certain chemotherapeutic agents can cause myocarditis. Um, doxorubicin, I think, is like infamous for causing cardiomyopathy. Uh, radiation, transplant, giant cell myocarditis, SLE. So there's a lot of different causes. Here is a um, patient who has myocarditis. It's hard to see on, it's hard to see on um, contrast enhanced CT. But what I want to show you here is that myocarditis is an inflammatory change. So you can cause reactive surrounding changes, including pleural fusion. So here you see two large bilateral pleural fusions um, from, as a reactive effusion from the underlying myocarditis. This was our question, what is the most common cause of myocarditis? And the answer is, what is the answer? Viral, correct, okay. Um, Coxsackie, you should know. Um, neoplasm, uh, there's two that USMLE said that you, you should know. There's 
different different types, but here's two that you should know, sort of on a basic um, level: myxoma and metastases. Uh, myxoma. Here is an example of a myxoma that we see in in which chamber? Which chamber is this? Remember the pulmonary veins drain into this. Good, right? Left atrium. So it occurs in the left atrium mostly, uh, and it causes a ball valve obstruction um, of in the left atrium. You know, you can imagine, right? This is what valve again? What valve is this? that can regurge if you have a papillary rupture. Good, mitral valve, right? So you can imagine this mass like being in the way of the um, right outflow, I mean the, the, the mitral valve um, flow, right? So it causes a ball valve mechanism, so the ball kind of gets stuck and then interferes with feeling of the, um, the left ventricle. Uh, and that's, so patients can have they can sort of just become syncopal because you have just poor feeling, so you don't have appropriate um, stroke volume. What is the frequency of, so Andrea asked, what's the frequency of heart neoplasm? Incredibly rare, incredibly rare. Um, in fact, um, metastasis is actually way, way, way more common than primary heart neoplasm, 30 to 1. So these are not common things, but um, if you do see something, then it's most more likely to be metastases just because cancer prevalence is so high, you know, and you can get metastatic involvement of the heart. So this here's an example of that. Uh, you have invasion of um, the myocardium with exhibit extension into the right heart system and, you know, pleural fusion, probably a pleural met here. Uh, so that's more common, but those are the two things that you, sh you should know about per USMLE. So the cardiac metastases are much more common than primary uh, tumors of the heart. Heart failure. So um, the chordae tendony is like little things, the little ropes that attaches the mitral valve, and it's connected by the papillary muscle. Um, so this, and this is, we're going to focus on the left ventricle because that's where a lot of the high, you know, morbidity um, diseases involve. Uh, it's the left ventricle. Um, so anyways, this is the um, aorta. So this is a left ventricular outflow tract. Um, we've, we've talked about this multiple times already, the mitral valve and then the papillary muscles and so the chordae tendony are the little cords that attach the valves to the muscle and that regulate the opening and the closing of the valve. We'll go into details. So here's our question, uh, quiz question. So here the mitral valve should oppose each other, right? It should close like a door, um, but here it's not closing because it's sort of just like flailing. There's some calcifications as well in the mitral annulus. Um, so here's the aorta. This is a left ventricular outflow tract, LVOT. Uh, and then here you have a flail lung. And so here is the pathology, um, the papillary muscle, chordae tendony, and you, have, you see it's like torn. Um, so that can lead to regurgitation. So that is correct. Um, heart failure. So there's all of these things can lead to heart failure. And when you have heart failure, your heart pump, love, ventricle, ventricle is not really working anymore. Um, so you can then, that leads to congestive heart failure. So there's several stages of congestive heart failure. You have a redistribution where the, so in, instead of you know pumping the heart out, like the blood out into the systemic flow, it's kind of like stuck in the venous, in the lungs, because it's not able to pump out, right? And so because there's venous pressure, the, the veins start to get engorged, and then they start to get bigger. You see that how it's, you just have more flow, backflow because the pump is not working as well. So then that can lead to um, more blood in the lungs, and then you get sort of fluid going into the interstitium and that leads to 
uh, curly B lines. This is the inter the, the septum, the the pulmonary unit. Um, and you have the um, the the septal thickening from the edema, and then if it gets really bad, it can then go into the airways. I mean, to the alveoli, um, the interstitium first, and then go into the airways, and then patients can have hypoxia, shortness of breath. Um, and then, so here's an example. You have uh, a lot of airspace opacity from CHF, and then they get Lasix, they get diuresed, and then it clears up and they feel better. Okay, so with heart failure, so heart failure is just a sequelae of something else that's causing the failure, right? So, and that can come from a lot of different causes. Um, you can have um, valves, you can have a myocardial thing, you can have a pericardial thing, you can have other causes of heart failure. It's just a sequelae of the underlying disease. So here is one cause of heart failure, and this is one of our quiz questions. So this is the mitral valve, and you see, and during systole, mitral valve is supposed to close, but it's, you can see there's this regurgitated jet. This, this is called mitral valve regurgitation, or insufficiency, it's, it means the same thing. Um, and so that can be from, um, you know, we said papillary muscle, different causes of regurgitation, one being papillary muscle rupture from MI. Here is a echo equivalent of mitral valve regurgitation. Um, so here you've got the mitral valve, and this is the left ventricle because you have hypertrophy, not hypertrophy, but the muscles are thicker. Uh, that's normal. Uh, and you see the, the little valves flapping. Um, and then now you see like this thing here is just gonna like flailing. Oh, excuse me, that's the next image here. So it's not opposing. Um, so it's hard, but you can see how you can get more information on the cardiac MR and CNA and it's complete, right? You're, you don't, you're not limited by the small field of view here. We only see a small field of view here. We see the entire heart, um, actually you see the entire chest too. I just cropped it to the heart. Um, so this was our question. What is the problem? And I think most people already said it, um, it's mitral valve regurgitation because during systole, it's not supposed to go back to the atrium. Ischemic heart disease, okay, so acute myocardial infarction. So here is, um, this is we're talking, now we're talking about MI, and we need to talk about that because it's a very common cause of morbidity and mortality in the United States, all around the world, actually. Um, so here, what we see is a chest CT, and has contrast because the aorta is bright. Um, so the left anterior descending artery is, um, so that's the left coronary artery and it branches into the left, LEDs are here, right? So if you look at the LED, here that's a calcium, but there's no contrast in it. There's contrast proximal, but there's no contrast distal. So here's a reconstruction of that image. So you have contrast, and then there's this clot here. So the most common cause of MI is what? What causes MI? Or, I mean, it, it, you can see it on the image. What's the cause of this patient's MI? There's no flow distally, right? So, ischemia from what? So, you know, I'm a radiologist. I'm an, I think anatomically. Um, so, let's talk about structural problems of ischemia. What's causing ischemia in this case? Okay, so ASHA says poor coronary artery. Yes. Poor, yes, that's true, but what is the cause of the good, right? So is it Archina? Is that your name? Um, um, atherosclerotic plaque, right? And you can see that here, right? So this dense stuff is calcifications, and here this dark stuff is the non-calcified atherosclerosis. So there's two types of athero, calcified and non-calcified. The non-calcified ones are kind of soft. That's the lipid stuff that's sort of buried in the intima. And then the calcified, eventually, you know, the body reacts to it and it sort of walls it off and calcifies. So you can have both. And eventually that causes the narrowing and constriction of the coronary arteries. And then, then you know, just blocks it up all together. Um, so then you no longer have flow. But there's a lot of different causes of blockage. Another cause of um, blockage is like vasculitides. So you can just have an intrinsically, you know, inflammation of the coronary arteries um, that leads to spasm. Um, you can have 
thromboembolic, you can have clot elsewhere that then comes down and lodges in here and obstructs the flow. Uh, so there's different causes. You can have dissection. If you have people with aortic dissection, the flap comes down and dissects out the coronary artery and causes um, obstruction. So there's a lot of different structural causes, the most common being primary athro. So it's an intrinsic problem just because of the prevalence of diabetes, hypertension, all the chronic diseases, but lots of different causes. So when you have acute occlusion of the LAD, remember we said, you know, it can you sort of take out the left ventricle, the pump, it can lead to papillary rupture. And we said, we saw an example of regurgitation, right, on MR. So that regurgitation jet then like shoots into the atrium, the right atrium, and it goes back into the pulmonary veins. And then it goes into the heart, right? So you have an acute pulmonary edema. And it's typically on the right side because look, the jet is going into the right pulmonary vein here. So you can see here regurgitation. You, you can imagine if it's acute, you have this like really strong jet that goes into the pulmonary vein and it goes back up into the right heart. And so that's, this is um, what you get with cardiogenic pulmonary edema from an acute MI. Are you guys with me so far? I think sometimes it's like easier to understand when you can actually just look at the structure, the anatomy, and then see where everything goes. Ischemic heart disease. So it's most commonly due to athro, we said. Uh, you, you, know, you can get troponins uh, and other sort of blood biomarkers. And um, patients who have angina, sort of like unstable heart disease. So in like angina, what happens is the flow is narrowed. So it's like traffic, you know? Like if you have part one, one lane of the freeway that's under construction, right? It just starts to get really narrow and it starts to slow down. Um, so if you have athro, right? That's what's happening. It's like slowing down the flow. So you start to get angina, right? So patients are running around, playing with their kids, whatever. There's an increased demand, but the flow is like our typical 405 freeway. You know, it's just slowly trickling in. So they start to have angina. And unstable angina is when it doesn't go away after they relax. It doesn't go away because that means that it's going to sort of um, eminently occlude and they can have major cardiac arrest. So hopefully you can prevent that. Um, my, diet, my, my dad has stable angina and he actually died of an MI when I was seven. And the idea is to catch these people before they have uh, that kind of event, like a cardiac arrest. And you can do that through um, imaging. So here is an example of a nuclear medicine stress test. And so you have rest and stress test. So what you do is basically looking at the flow to the myocardium. You give them a um, radio tracer, uh, which is um, a very small dose of iodine or not radiation, and it goes to the heart. So these are the different slices of the heart. So normally it should be perfused. So here the black stuff is showing that there's normal perfusion, homogeneous, symmetric here, here, and here, right? And then you do a, uh, and you do it on different, and then you do it when there's working out when they're running on the treadmill and then you measure the same parts of the heart and to make sure that they're normal, right? That means there's adequate perfusion when there's an increased demand on the heart because they're exercising. Here on the other hand is a, a defect. So same, just, just know this is the um, part of the heart, right? So here at rest, this area is not getting as much flow um, as the rest of the heart. This is, um, this is the left, this is the left ventricle um, here. I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to lose you guys. So let me just go back to the views. Um, so this view here, let's just look at the vertical long axis. This view here is this view here, right here. Okay. So this is what we're looking at. Um, so here, let's vertical long axis, right? So this year, there's asymmetric decreased um, activity right here. And so that is corresponding to this muscle here, right? This is the interventricular septum, which is supplied by the LED because the LED is right here. Are you guys with me? Have I lost you guys? Um, so what this is showing is that this part of the heart, when it's 
patient's exercising is getting inadequate perfusion. There's not enough flow going to this heart. So this patient can um, benefit from revascularization. You can have, if it's like a fixed defect, which means um, this part doesn't get flow when they're resting and it doesn't get flow when they're stressed, when they're exercising, then that means the, that heart is already dead and you can't really salvage it, right? So what you wanna do is catch the patients who have flow while they're resting and then have decreased flow when they're exercising because that means it's salvageable. You can revascularize the patient with either cabbage, coronary stents, and then restore flow and then um, help them and pre you know, prevent a major cardiac event. Um, so Peter says, the VLA mostly visualize the left ventricle. Well, this is all ventricle. This is all left ventricle. Remember, this left ventricle is the only one we care about. Um, and But the VLA looks at this um, view of the left ventricle, right? So you can either get a short axis, you can get a long axis, you can get a vertical long axis. So the VLA, I'm only pointing the VLA out because I have a comparable cross-sectional imaging where I can show you what it looks like on MR. But it, this, they're, they're just different cross-sections. Okay, so um, so if the patient is a fixed, so typically we say if more than 50% of the myocardium um, is fixed, um, more than the, that you can't really reverse it. If it's less than 50%, then you can revascularize the patient and try to restore flow and you know actually help uh, the patient prevent an acute MI. Um, this is uh, Agustin store score. Um, so we said the most common cause of um, MI is athro, right? So athro is calcified and non-calcified plaque. And now you can actually quantify the severity, the extent of calcification. So here, this is um, an Agust Agustin store, coronary calcification score, so LAD, right? This is the RCA. Uh, and I'll give off the PDA. And then in the back is the circumflex right here, coming off the L left coronary. So now you can like look at the calcifications here and then give you a quantitative score of all the vessels. So um, patients with high Agustin score have a high risk of developing a major adverse cardiac event, right? Because it tells you the, the calcification burden. So the American Cardiology foundation which is the cardiology society equivalent uh, they recommend getting cal coronary calcium score or agustin score when the patient is these are the four indications so they're asymptomatic uh, and they have a risk um, they are um, asymptomatic with diabetes right because diabetes increases risk of so these are basic you're trying to prevent uh, coronary event so these are when you should get um, order a study um, per the Cardiology Foundation. The risk calculator, and yeah, I'm sure you guys have heard about the Framingham cardiovascular risk. It's like, you know, it goes through all the risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, age, things like that, cholesterol. But they've shown in one study that um, coronary artery calcification outperformed Framingham score in risk stratifying your risk of developing a major cardiac event. Okay, let's talk about. So those are the diagnostic ways um, to identify patients before they get an MI. Uh, but once you have an MI, then these are the complications that you can, patients can develop based on timing. So right away when you have an MI, we said, right, the RCA goes to the nodes, the LCA, I mean, it's just like the heart is like kind of, you know, acutely distressed. So the most important cause of death is actually arrhythmias because it's no longer, it's, you know, you have like VTAC, ventricular arrhythmia, because it, it's sort of, it has no flow. So it's like ischemic and so it starts to spaz. So you get VTAC that can lead to death. And um, assuming that you survive that event, uh, then there's other things that happens later. So if you get this inflammatory pericarditis, um, which can cause that friction rub. You know, we learn about all these 
you know, signs and symptoms that you, maybe you'll never hear ever again unless you become a cardiologist. Uh, then you get papillary muscle rupture, uh, typically two to seven days, and we talked about why, right? Uh, interventricular septal rupture, um, which can then lead to VSD. We'll see, we'll see some of these examples. Um, you get free wall rupture, five to 14 days. And then aneurysm, typically at the apex. Um, and then Dressler syndrome, that's an autoimmune phenomenon, and it happens weeks after MI. I guess the body reacts to it, and then you start to get this fibrinous pericarditis. Uh, and then eventually you get left ventricular failure, and then you know you get cardiomyopathy. So when do we see left ventricular wall rupture after MI? Guesses? C. C. Okay. Correct. So immediately the cause of death is um, arrhythmias, VTAC, and then um, the, the right. So sh then you get this pericarditis, which is different from the dresser's pericarditis, which is autoimmune related. This is more sort of like reactive right away. Um, and yeah, complication. So here's an example. You get um, cardiac rupture. So you can get here a rupture, and then you get um, hemopericardium. So you get blood that's like spewing into the pericardial space. And then that itself can cause compression of the heart. I mean, the worst part, you have a hole in the heart, right? You don't want to have the hole in the heart, especially in the pump. And the, you know, the left ventricle, which is the pump of the heart. Um, and then here are some other examples. Um, so here we have acute pericarditis after an MI. So this is um, the left ventricle. This is the right ventricle, the left, ventric, left ventricle is thick, thick, and thick, thick walled. But you see the pericardium, so there's um, visceral and parietal pericardium, and there's the potential space between there. It's enhancing, so it's white, so it's enhancing, so it's inflamed. So this is what we get typically one to three days after a post-MI, if the patient had an MI. If the patient has not had an MI, then there's other causes of pericarditis, right? We said the most common cause um, oh, infection, Kawasaki. Uh, it can be from autoimmune diseases uh, and, of course, cardiovascular events from MI, radiation therapy. So a lot of different causes. So it happens. You have to interpret this in the context of the patient's presentation. Um, here is a, a complication of MI, a left ventricular free wall rupture. Ooh, God, that looks nasty. Um, so here we see the left ventricle here. It also has a large hiatal hernia, but I hear. Let me stop here. So here's the aorta, aortic valve. Here's the left ventricle, and it looks really weird and bizarre. It's kind of lobulated. Um, and, right, so this, this is a mitral valve. Mitral valve, it's the atrium, this is the pulmonary veins going to the left ventricle. And the contrast, it's like outside the left ventricle. Uh, and that's because the patient has a hole in the left ventricle here um, from a rupture of the left ventricle. Um, this is different from a ventricular aneurysm. Um, let me see if I have an example of a ventricular aneurysm. Yeah, I do. Nice. Um, so here is a left ventricular aneurysm. So here it is here. This is bulging of the apex of the heart. And there's a thrombus in it. Um, so it's not enhancing, so that's a thrombus that can form in infarcted regions of the heart because there's no flow. So you have stasis of blood, which then clots, and then they develop um, thrombus clots. Here's a 3D reconstruction of the aneurysm. Okay, let's move on to we have 30 minutes left. Um, what slide am I on? 50. Okay, so we're going to move a little faster. Um, dilated cardiomyopathy is the most common cardiomyopathy. Uh, and here's an example of what it looks like. So look at, you've got the heart is huge, right? So you have the left ventricle, right ventricle. It's like everything is like just markedly dilated. A lot of different causes, often familial, but you 
people who are alcoholics can get this, viral causes, myocarditis, doxorubicin, sarcoid, peripartum cardiomyopathy. So the most common cause of cardiomyopathy is dilated cardiomyopathy, but there are other kinds of cardiomyopathies too. This is an example of Takosobu. This is, this is on the USMLE content list. Um, Takosobu is, here you see the left ventricle, it's the spine, anterior chest wall, and there's a bulging of the apex right here. You see that? So um, Takosobu is, it's a Japanese term, um, and it means broken heart syndrome. Uh, so basically patients' coronary arteries are clean. They're, they're totally fine. And it happens, they describe it as in people who um, have severe stress events. They just become so stressed out um, or, you know, say a broken heart after a divorce or after some, you know, traumatic separation. And so then they can develop a cardiomyopathy. It's transient, it's temporary. So when their stress have been resolved or removed, then it, their heart recovers. Um, but this is what it looks like on MR. See, there's like an abnormal enlargement of the apex. Oh, excuse me, here. Here. Right there. It almost looked like a ventricular aneurysm, a true aneurysm, but the myocardium is normal. It's not thinned. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is something that um, US Emily wants you to know. Um, so here we have chest CT, and you see the heart here you have, um, it's not, it's thickened and it's asymmetrically thickened, right? So we know the left side is a little thick, but if you look at the apex, it's like a, a lot more thick than normal heart. And that's just a um, problem that can happen in some people. It's a congenital problem. Um, and this can lead to arrhythmias. Uh, and so this is a leading cause of sudden death in young people from arrhythmias. And uh, it's inherited as well. This is first aid stuff that you should know. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there's two types. Um, there's symmetric and asymmetric. Uh, so here is an example of the asymmetric type. So here we saw over the apex here, over there, the septum here for some, it's like just markedly thickened. And this one um, is problematic because of where it is. And it, it's, it's the septum is thickened so you can lead outflow obstruction. So you can, remember we said the outflow, the left ventricle outflow into the aorta is here, right? So this thing is in the way, so it can cause problem and um, patients can collapse. And that, that happens with athletes. I think it was like one, one of the basketball players on the UCLA basketball team that was diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy just recently. Uh, and this is how you treat it. Um, you stop these high intensity athletics, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. Here is a uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy. Restrictive, by, it means, you know, it's stiff, right? It's stiff because the muscle, which is normally sort of elastic, is no longer, like, elastic anymore. It's, sort of, it's just stiff now. And that can happen for a lot of reasons. You can have infiltrative process, like sarcoid, amyloid, fibrosis, that just, you lose the normal elasticity of the myocardium. So it's stiff and it's just not pumping as well. Loeffler syndrome, first aid thing. It's an endomyocardial fibrosis um, with prominent eosinophilic infiltrate. Just, just remember that for first aid. I mean, for use only. And then you can forget it after um, because only cardiology people are going to see that. Um, myocarditis, signs and symptoms. Um, here is uh, an MRI. Uh, so what we see here is here... The, um, heart, right? So it's, uh, this is post contrast. So normal myocardium anteriorly is fine, but the posterior one is, there's a lot of contrast in it. It's bright compared to the dark myocardium. So this is myocarditis, just inflammation of the heart. And we said, remember, like, there's a lot of different causes of myocarditis. You can have viral, you can have post MI, you can have SLE. Like, anyway, so um, they get. If, they, it's, if it's from viral, then they get viral symptoms, and it typically goes away after the viral infection resolves. And you get edema, and you get um, increased blood flow, uh, which, can, which you can see on MRI. Okay, 
So let's talk about the pericardium. Uh, that's the little sac that encases the heart. Um, and here on the MRI, this is black line here. There's the visceral and parietal layer. Here on the CT is this white line here. And there's that dark stuff, the um, normal fat. And then the, the white stuff here on the MRI is fat, but that's the pericardium. And that can get inflamed. So there's um, parietal visceral layer of the serous pericardium and then the fibrous pericardium. And there's that space in between those two. So lots of things can um, involve the pericardium. You can get calcifications here, for example. So you have a stiff sac and that causes constrictive pericarditis. Here, we um, patients who get pericarditis acutely can cause reactive pulmonary edema, which is what we see here. Um, on the CT, what you see is uh, thickening. Here, I'll stop here. This one's good. So here is the heart, the left ventricle here. That's normal muscle. And there's a little fat space. And there's a pericardium that's around it here. And you see the pericardium should be uh, typically inconspicuous. You shouldn't be able to see it, but here it's very thickened and nodular looking. And so that can cause heart failure because the sac is, you know, stiff, but it causes reactive edema, which we see bilaterally, pleural fusion, just reactive. Okay, so Peter has a question. Uh, where is the contrast leaking from in free wall rupture? Oh, that was a question that I missed. Um, so let's go back. Uh huh. So let's remember where we are first. We're on 58, and let's go back to free wall rupture. Is this it? No. Where are we? Where is the free wall rupture? No. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, oh no, that was the quiz question. Oh, here, okay. So here, um, um, Peter, I'm assuming you're talking about this slide. Um, if not, just text it to me and tell me. Um, so here, the free wall rupture is coming from the posterior wall. So here's the left ventricle here. Here's a mitral valve, here's the left atrium. If you follow the left ventricle, it's discontinuous. Right there, it's discontinuous, there's a hole. And then it's going out into outside, right? So there's a hole and then now it's going outside. Um, so that's where it is. There's another question, another question, let me find it. Um, ah. Okay, JJ, I don't know what the awe is referring to, but I'm sorry I missed the chat box. Um, okay, let's go back to 58. 58. Um, is that where we are, 58? Pericardial fusion. Yes, we were here. Okay. Um, present. So, um, oh my, I'm sorry, just one sec, repeat that so that people like will burn, okay, what we're talking So yeah, I'm just going to, for the sake of recording, just review what I just said. Um, so here we said the pericardium is here and you have an effusion. Um, here the pericardium is, we see the same thing except it's dense, it's high, higher attenuation, it's brighter than this one, which is fluid. So this is hemoperitoneum, or in this case, the patient, serosanguinous, yeah. Um, here we have an MRI. So this is the left ventricle. This is the left atrium. This is the sort of the outer margin of the heart. And then this is the, um, the pericardium. And then this is the space in between, which is enlarged as an effusion. Here we have a thick, thickened pericardium. And this is from radiation from a patient who had Hodgkins. Here we have, um, oh, now we're talking about valves. Um, so valves, there are, um, we typically can replace either the aortic or the mitral valve typically. 
uh, and on chest radiograph, you can sort of figure out where they are based on the location. Um, so, but you know, I always just look at the chart so that you're not missing it. But the aorta is on the most superior part because that's the outflow. And you have the mitral valve very close to it, and you have the tricuspid because that's the right heart, right heart system. Mitral valve regurgitation we reviewed, um, but it can be from a lot of causes. So you can get prolapse, papillary muscle infarct, rheumatic heart disease, dilated cardiomyopathy. So it can be structural, right? These are all structural causes of regurgitation, either because it's dilated so then it doesn't co-opt normally, papillary infarct, the cordy tendony is ruptured, and so these all lead to prolapse. Um, and that, that you have downstream sequelae of left ventricular failure from dilatation with venous hypertension. So we, this is an acute um, regurgitation um, that causes the asymmetric right pulmonary edema, we said because the jet goes to the right side of the heart and you get this edema. Um, you can get mitral valve stenosis. And so when you get mitral, the most commonly from rheumatic, rheumatic fever, so the, the valve is like stiff. And so then you have the right, um, the atrium, the left atrium is like you have you know, because it's stiff, you can't go, there's a lot of high pressure system that develop. So here um, you get what they call like a double atrial sign, like this density here from an enlarged right atrium. And then you get an enlarged pulmonary artery because the right, that the system is so um, high that the, sorry, the left atrium, the pressure is so high because the mitral valve is so stiff that you get back up and it goes into the pulmonary artery and causes pulmonary hypertension. Aortic valve stenosis here is, um, this was one of our quiz, I think, but here, right, so during systole, it pumps, but it's like this going through this little tiny hole, and so you get this jet. Um, so here is high, the calcifications that here, there's leaflets, three leaflets here, and there's very, very high, very heavily calcified that leads to stiffening of the aortic outflow tract. And that's problematic because you can get left ventricular hypertrophy, and then that again leads down the left ventricular uh, failure. And you get this post stenotic jet. So you get this jet that then causes the aorta to get big, ectatic. So you guys got this right. Um, what is this? And everything, most people said it was the aortic um, stenosis. You have this like really high flow jet. Okay. Um, complications of uh, valves. Wait, so we need to know this for per the USMLE. So there's, a, you know, we can do different types of valves to replace um, um, disease valves. And uh, if they have valves, it's MR compatible. Um, complications of valves, you can get stenosis, you can get inflammatory panis, uh, endocarditis, you know, that's why people who get dental procedures should get prophylax. Uh, structural failure, like the actual valve can dislocate, you know, problem. You can get leaks and thrombus. Uh, so, but you know, we have pretty good techniques now. So um, there's actually increasing use of percutaneous valve. Before it was an open heart surgery. Um, when I was a uh, surgical resident on cardiothoracic rotation, like the one patient with aortic valve, aortic stenosis that I took care of, like died because it was like an open surgery and they like, you know, it's just a very morbid procedure. So. Now they have percutaneous treatments of it, and we'll see an example. Oh no, what, is there not an example? Oh my God, are you serious? Where's my tabber? Oh, oh my gosh, it didn't make it in. Um, okay, I, I'm gonna go off because I think this is really cool stuff that you should know. Um, do you guys know about tabbers? My tower video didn't make it, unfortunately. Um, oh, maybe it's here. It's so cool. You guys have to like know about this stuff. This is this is this is the current and future direction, not surgery. Um, but I don't know where happened to my slide. Oh, here's my slide. Oh, here's my here's my video. Okay, so here is um, the video that I thought I was in there, but I guess it didn't make it. That's okay. We'll see it. Watch it here. So a TAVR, you know, instead of having an open heart surgery where you like basically like rip open the chest wall and then replace their cardiac, now they can do it percutaneously. So you go into the common femoral artery, put a sheath in, and then you put a catheter up, 
um, make your way up north. Oops, yeah. Sorry, so you make your way up north, right there, right? Go to the aortic valve, and then once you're there, you can put this little, what, what is this? Okay, let's expedite this guy. Go. Okay, so, oh yeah, so then you get the catheter, you dilate this thing, do an annual plasto, right? And then you put the heart valve, the prosthesis, and then boom, you just put it there. Isn't that great? Now the patient doesn't have to have open surgery. They won't be suffering from pain. Um, there's, you know, complication and rates are not insignificant with open heart surgery, uh, but less with percutaneous treatment. So that, that's what I mean by the newer percutaneous valves that are coming because it's just less morbid. A lot of things can now be treated percutaneously, actually, and it's all done by, uh, well, the TAVRs are done by cardiology, but some of the other percutaneous treatments are done by radiology, interventional radiology. Okay, congenital heart disease, we got 10 minutes. Um, yeah, you have right to left shunts and then left to right shunts. So right side uh, is like blue, right? It's non-oxygenated, it's deprived. So if you have a right to left shunt, then you get early cyanosis, blue babies. These are the T's that causes it. Um, the left side we said is oxygenated. So oxygenated shunts, you get late cyanosis because there's some oxygen going to the body. The right side, like the non-oxygenated blood, the right to left shunts, there's no oxygen going to the, the body. So you get early cyanosis. And then we're gonna see some examples. So this um, question is false. You get early cyanosis with right to left shunts because the right side is not oxygenated. There's a way to remember this. Right to left, early. This is from first stage. Left to right, late, late cyanosis. Um, per persistent, okay, here are examples of right to left shunts. Um, PDA, so basically the aorta and pulmonary artery are supposed to be two separate tubes. And a uh, persistent trunk is arteriosis, it's one tube instead of two tubes. Um, so you get mixing of blood, you get this giant VSD, so patients get um, cyanotic. Transposition of the great vessels, so you have the two tubes, which is fine, except the two tubes are switched. So the aorta normally is supposed to come out of the left ventricle, right, because it's a pump that goes to the body. But here, instead of the aorta coming out of the left ventricle, it's coming out of the right ventricle which is the deoxygenated stuff. So patients will die pretty fast if they don't get this thing recognized early and then treated. They can pick this up in the prenatal um, ultrasound. Okay. Tetralogy of flow. Um, here, let's go, let's go to this one uh, because this is the mechanism for it. But the, it's, tetralogy of flow is the infundibular septum. So this part of the septum is, is thickened and it's like in the wrong place. So it's anterior and superior. So what this does is it causes obstruction of the pulmonary, the outflow tract, the pulmonary veins. So you get this pulmonary atresia equivalent, right? Because it's kind of narrowing it. And it, it, this, is, this is what leads to all the findings that we see with TET. So, okay, here's your first aid prof, right? P, pulmonary infundibular stenosis, right? The out, the, the, we said that it's because this infundibular septum is like thickened and it's in the wrong place. So it narrows the pulmonary atresia. So you get pulmonary stenosis. And then you get right ventricular hypertrophy. Remember we said anything that blocks the pulmonary outflow will cause the right heart to pump harder. So it's pumping hard, hard, hard because it's like really narrowed. And then so it gets right ventricular hypertrophy. The other finding with TET is overriding aorta. So that's because, so the aorta, aorta is supposed to be on like here and they crisscross. But here the aorta is like over the septum. So that's why they call it overriding aorta. So instead of being on its side, it's kind of pushing its way to the right side and overriding um, the septum. So that's the overriding part. And then um, you get a VSD, right? You have a communication between the two ventricles and you need this. You need this because if you don't have this, the patient is going to die. Um, so to help with mixing of the blood. So anyways, um, that, those are, this thing causes the four findings that we see with TET. Okay. Um, what else? 
So patients get these TET spells. They, right, they, they have some mixing, so they're not going to like die right away, like you see um, with like, for example, transposition of the gray vessels. Um, but when they, so often caused by crying fever and exercise due to exacerbation of right outflow obstruction. Um, so when they do anything that strain them, it makes it harder um, for the, um, it just exacerbates it, I guess. Okay, so uh, total anomalous venous return. Remember we said the veins should drain into the Total left. anomalous pulmonary venous oh, return. Uh, oh, shoot. All right, how do I present this? But I don't want the sound to come on. Um, okay, so let's mute you. Okay, and then so... Remember the veins we said drains in the left atrium, right? That's the normal place that the veins should drain. But in total anomalous um, TAPVR, the vein doesn't drain in the left atrium. There's like no communication. So instead what they do is they join together and then they drain up high through this vertical vein and then that gets dumped back into the SVC. So that's a problem because you have like abnormal venous return, right? It's not, the oxygenated blood is supposed to go to the body, but it's not, it's going back into the right heart. So that, that's what pulmonary uh, TA, TA PVR is. And it could be, they can dump to the SVC or it can actually, it could be from the IVC. So you can have supra or infradiaphragmatic TA PVR. Um, but anyways, if you have that, it has to be corrected. Um, let me, I need to, I need to window, window it um, so that I can see your chat box. And the only way I can do that is to make it that, okay. Um, so Peter has a question. The question is, in this case, in the entire body, depending on the right ventricle, of TAPVR? Uh, so you, they have to have a shunt. Yeah, so there's like a, there's like a shunt, typically, like a VSD, uh, so that there's like mixing of blood so that it, um, you know, the body doesn't like die. Um, so it, it's, so you have a shunt between the right and left ventricle, and then that allows the part to then pump out sort of mixed oxygenated blood. I hope that answers your question. If not, keep texting. Um, Epstein's anomaly is another anom uh, congenital problem that you should know per USMLE. So remember we said the tricuspid valve is supposed to appear, but in an Epstein anomaly, it's just congenitally abnormally located. So it's, it's you know, it makes the right ventricle really small. Um, what they call it atrialization. Uh, so then you have poor right heart function. And it can be due to lithium exposure in utero. Uh, you get tricuspid regurgitation. Um, okay. Okay, now left to right shunt. So left side is oxygenated. So the oxygenated stuff goes to the right side, which is fine, not a big deal, because that's what causes late cyanosis, right? So left to right, late, L. Um, and so these are frequencies, so VSD, ASD, and then um, patent, patent ductus arteriosus. So we're going to talk about that. So VSD is the most common congenital cardiac defect. Uh, they usually are asymptomatic because you have, you know, oxygenated stuff going to the right side. But then eventually they'll um, become symptomatic. Here is an ASD. Um, so you have the left atrium, the right atrium. The IVC drains into the right atrium. So you have a hole between the septum that separates the two chambers. And um, ostium, okay, this is ostium secundum defects. This is from first aid. Ostium secundum defects most commonly and usually occur as isolated finding. That's the most common, it's, they call it secundum. Um, but there's another type, an ostium primum, which is in a different location and that has other congenital association. That's the extent that you need to know. You don't need to know exactly where it is and what it looks like for USMLE. Just know that it's ostium primum is associated with congenital abnormalities, whereas secundum is sort of the more common one that doesn't have association. It's like omphaloceles and gastroschisis, right? Omphaloceles have congenital association, gastroschisis don't. That's the, um, for uh, um, general presentation. Symptoms range from none to heart failure. So depending on the size, uh, your presentation will vary. Here is a patent ductus arteriosus. So, you know, in fetuses, um, the patent, this ductus is open because, um, 
because of the physiology of the fetus, right? They don't, their heart, it, it completely bypasses the lungs because they're not breathing. They're in a sack of like amniotic fluid. Um, and so the, the mother's pro providing all the oxygenated blood. So they don't need the heart. So they have this ductus that basically bypasses the entire lungs. Uh, and so it communicates from um, the atrium, the right atrium into to, your, to the aorta. So here. Uh, but the minute the baby's delivered, they cry. That first cry brings in tons of oxygen into their lungs. And that um, should cause the, this to close off uh, not normally. But some people have persistent patent ductus arteriosus. So you basically have this communication that persists. Um, and then that could cause problems um, because you have mixing of blood again. So uh, I guess you get this continuous machine-like murmur uh, because there's just continuous communication and it can lead to late cyanosis uh, if it's big enough. Um, Eisenmenger syndrome. Okay, so Eisenmenger syndrome is if you have a chronic left to right, right? So oxygenated blood uh, goes to the sort of non-oxygenated side, which is, this is why you get late cyanosis, not early because it's oxygenated, that's mixing. But the problem is over time, the right heart is supposed to be a low pressure system. But because the because you have a VSD or an ASD, the right side is now a high pressure system. So it has a compensatory right ventricular hypertrophy. And this is not good uh, because then you know you get problems associated with RVH. So you get um, uh, you know the right side is supposed to be low pressure, so you get late cyanosis, clubbing, um, polycythemia. They get this clubbing thing here where the fingertips are sort of like rounded in appearance and little, yeah, those clubbed fingers. So they can actually close this off um, with an Amplatz catheter uh, plug, depending on the size. Coarctation, another thing that you should know per USMLE content list. So with coarctation, um, you have like abnormal narrowing of the aorta at the juxtal ductal region, the ductus arteriosus. So that's a congenital thing, but it can also be associated with certain syndromes. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but what happens is because you have this narrowing, you get collateral flow. I mean, the oxygenated blood needs to make it to the body somehow. So what it does is then form these collateral vessels, intercostals, everything like that. And those intercostals, the arteries become really big. So the big arteries are under, the, this is the internal mammary typically here it causes this notching appearance because, you know, arteries pump and so then it causes the notching of the undersurface of the, of the ribs. So that's the notching appearance that happens from these big dilated arteries that we normally don't see because you have um, coarct. Okay, congenital defects that you should know um, it's from first aid. Alcohol, okay, fetal alcohol syndrome uh, associated with a lot of congenital stuff. TET, VSD, PADS, rubella, Down syndrome, get VSD, ASD, this atrial septal defect. Diabetics, moms um, can lead to a transposition of the great vessels where it's switched. Um, Marfans, um, they get mitral valve prolapse, thoracic aortic aneurysm, aortic regurge. Uh, and then these are other syndromes. So people who have lithium exposure as a, in the prenatal period, they can get Epstein anomaly. Remember that's the, the tricuspid valve that's sort of, um, sort of low in the right uh, ventricle. Turner syndrome, they get bicuspid aortic valve and coarct, Turner syndrome. Williams, superventricular um, aortic stenosis. So the answer to this question, what causes bicuspid aortic valve and coarct? Um, I think most of you guys got it, it was Turner's. Okay, that's it. 12 o'clock, we made it.